Hello, I'm Larry Wilson, and welcome to our fifth study on the coming Antichrist. This topic is of, is of enormous importance for every Christian and non-Christian as well. The coming of the Antichrist is going to be a, an event that will involve the whole world. It's a story that will affect every living person. And I want to try to take the, the matter for a moment out of just a mere religious perspective and put it into the context of a reality that will exist during the time period of the Great Tribulation. Now, the Bible tells us a number of things about the coming Antichrist, and we've been examining these in the previous uh, segments in this seminar. I would like to go to the computer and review just very quickly the six-step process by which God works. What I'm trying to, to show is that the coming of the Antichrist, which is predicted in Scripture, is going to be the physical appearing of Lucifer with his angels, and Lucifer comes on a mission to destroy the world, or much of the world. He does not entirely destroy it, but he, he will destroy enough so that he can, for a short time, take complete dominion of the world and, in, and set up and enforce the mark of the beast. Most people have the un misunderstanding that the coming Antichrist is a religious system. I've, I've heard people say it's the Pope. I've heard people say that it was Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, Gorbachev. I've heard people say it was Ronald Reagan. I've heard people say all kinds of things about who the Antichrist is and who the beast is. Some have even said the beast is a big computer in Belgium somewhere. The, the truth is, the Antichrist that the Scripture speaks of, the, the central Antichrist, I'm talking about a capital T, H-E, the Antichrist that is coming, is none other than the one who has been Antichrist for thousands of years. And his name is Lucifer, or the Satan, or the devil. He's a fallen angel. He was a created being. He deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he was cast out of heaven on Resurrection Sunday in Revelation chapter 12. The point that I'm making is that the devil is going to be allowed to come to earth and God is going to give him the power and the authority to destroy much of the world. Because when Satan is finally allowed to appear, he comes to deal with those in rebellion. Okay, let's go to the computer screen and notice these six steps to keep in mind when reading Old Testament prophets because the end of the world imitates these same six steps. There's a six-step process that God consistently follows. First, in the Old Testament, when a nation becomes corrupt, God responds. What does he do? God sends warnings through spokespersons or prophets. And when these warnings are ignored, God raises up a corporate destroyer for the benefit of future generations. As you've heard me say in the last month's study, that when God raises up a corporate destroyer, I'm talking about destroying the nation. God destroys a corrupt nation so that subsequent generations can live with less of the curse of sin resting on it. You see, the sins of the fathers are transferred to the children and to the third and fourth generation. That's right. 
the wicked and decadent behavior of parents gets passed on to the children and to their grandchildren and to their great-grandchildren. So that in, in history, we have the rise and fall of 21 civilizations. In each case, all of these fell as a result of judgments of God brought about because of degeneracy and decadence. At one time, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, was at the height of d dominion during the days of Solomon. But when after Solomon died, in just 300 years, less than 300 years, the king of Assyria totally destroyed the ten northern tribes of Israel. And then about 75 years later, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the southern two tribes and plowed Jerusalem under in 586 B.C. My point here is that the, the process that we see concerning Israel in the Old Testament is really the same process for all nations, for all peoples. God is no respecter of persons. And what he has done to his own people, and in actually, we, the earth and all that's in it belong to him. But what he has done to those he chose to be his representatives is a parallel to what he's done to all the rest of the nations of the world. The parallel, God's government doesn't play favorites. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God didn't suddenly love the world after uh, the flood or after Abraham. No, God loved the world from the beginning. He made it to be inhabited. And he loves all of the children, all of the people that are on this planet. And so when a nation becomes corporately decadent, God sends a corporate destroyer. And uh, he has two reasons for doing this. One is to pay back that generation, that decadent generation, for the evil that it has done. And secondly, for the benefit of future generations that will inherit that land. You know, there's a ton of um, Canaanite tribes that were literally obliterated, man, woman, and child, off of the face of the earth because God wanted to give that land to another people who would have a period of probation and grace and opportunity. But when a nation becomes decadent and apostate, and does not recognize the sovereignty of God, nor the will of God, nor the commands of God, God steps into action. I call it the full cup principle. When the cup gets full, God pours it out upon their heads, the sins, and the destruction comes. So, going back to the computer screen, you notice that God sent Assyria to destroy Israel. God sent the king of Babylon to destroy Judah, and God is going to send the Antichrist to destroy the world shortly before the second coming. Now, notice in the Old Testament, after destruction, God always, always consistently speaks of restoration. Restoration is always promised. And, number five, God promises destruction of those whom he used as agents of his wrath. In other words, God always promises to destroy the destroyer. Uh, we see this in Isaiah 10, Jeremiah chapter 25, and Jeremiah 50, uh, and Isaiah 44 and 45. We see it constantly in the Old Testament that God, when a nation becomes uh, decadent and degenerate and it's time to destroy it, God sends a destroyer and then God destroys the destroyer because of the same sins 
that he used to destroy the first nation. I'm trying to get you to see that God follows a pattern. Patterns are very important, for they tell us that God is consistent. If God are, is whimsical and arbitrary and there, there's no pattern, then there's only chaos. But when law and fairness and justice follows a very clear pattern, then everybody knows the rules, everybody knows the consequences, everybody knows what's coming down before it comes down. So, step number five is that God promises the destruction of the destroyer. And certainly, at the second coming, we see the same thing true because God will destroy uh, Lucifer. And last, throughout the Old Testament, God clearly makes reference to the establishment of an eternal kingdom where his children will live forever and ever and ever. Now, we're going to jump backwards to around 740 B.C. And we're going to consider the fate of the destroyer, Assyria. God is about to send Assyria to destroy his people, the ten northern tribes. But I want to focus in now on the destroying the destroyer. Notice what God says, Isaiah 10, 24. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says. O oh, my people who live in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians who beat you with a rod and lift up a club against you as Egypt did. See, God is saying, look, I have sent the king of Assyria over here in Isaiah chapter 8. I have sent the king of Assyria to deal with you for your apostasy, but I'm saying to my remnant, the remnant of my people who live in Zion, don't be afraid of the Assyrians whom I have given power and authority to beat you and to lift up a club against you. Very soon, verse 25, my anger against you will end and my wrath will be directed to their destruction. So God is talking to Israel through Isaiah and he says, very soon my anger against you will end and my wrath will be directed to the destruction of Assyria. You see, God used Babylon to destroy Judah, and then later, Babylon was to be clubbed or punished after God uses Nebuchadnezzar to punish Judah. Notice Jeremiah 51.11. I'm showing you these patterns. Notice 51.11. Sharpen the arrows and take up the shields. The Lord has stirred up the kings of the Medes because his purpose is to destroy whom? Babylon. The Lord will take vengeance, vengeance for his temple. So we see that God destroys the destroyer. This is true with Assyria. This is true with Babylon. It's true with Egypt. It's true all throughout the ages. And when I look at World War I and World War II and Vietnam and Korea and other battles during this past century, I look at them not as the historians look at them, although it's important to see how things actually occurred, but I look at it from the space shuttle, if you will, looking at God's management of the world in general. I'm saying that God raised up Hitler and gave him authority and power to bring destruction to greater parts of Europe and Asia, Asia, but then God destroyed Hitler. I'm saying that Jesus Christ is the ruler, the sovereign king of the earth, and he rules over the kings of the earth, and he sets them up and he takes them down to accomplish his purposes. They think they're doing it for themselves, but ah, the Lord says, they are my servants, they are doing my bidding. And if you'll go back into the Old Testament, and if you study how that God calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant, how that God calls Cyrus his anointed, how that God calls Shalmaneser V, the king of Assyria, the club of his wrath, 
you begin to see the pattern. And the big picture is that when a corporate body of people become apostate and degenerate, God sends a destroyer to destroy them for the benefit of nations to come and for people that to come. He clears the land so that others can have it. At the end, God deals with a planet in rebellion, a world that is degenerate, a world that is refusing to hear his truth and so be saved. And so God sends a destroyer, and the destroyer is the Antichrist, and he will come with his great army of millions of angels, and he will destroy a third of mankind. I, I hope I'm making sense because what I am describing is about to affect you and me. What I'm describing has no <clears throat> modern day parallel. What I'm describing has no, um, what's the right word here? There is no reality by which to draw a comparison. You have to take it on, the, on your faith in God's Word. Let's go back to the computer screen. We're talking here about God going to bring judgment upon that heathen nation of Babylon, world empire, lift up a banner, or lift up a signal flag, as a banner is, against the walls of Babylon. Reinforce the guard Station the watchman, prepare an ambush. The Lord will carry out his purpose, his decree against the people of Babylon. If he does this against Babylon, what will he do against the world? If not the very same thing. Let me show you a picture. Let's go back to the computer screen and let me pick up a little picture here. Here you see a group of people. You see five guys and one girl. If I were going to choose one of these guys and then try to have you identify who I have in mind, wouldn't you agree with me that the more detail that I give you about the guy that I have in mind, the more narrow becomes the definition and the more certain becomes the selection? Certainly. If I said, here are five guys and one girl, and I am the one that I have chosen out of this group that I want you to identify, is a guy. Well, you would immediately say, hmm, well, I know it's not her because he's chosen one of the five. So by telling you that I've chosen one of the guys, you will say, okay, so we've reduced the possibilities of defining who the right person is now from six to five. And let's suppose I said to you, this guy has two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. And you look around and you say, well, they all have two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. But let's suppose I tell you that this guy that I'm thinking of has an open mouth. Well, you might say, well, that his mouth is open right here. His mouth is certainly open. His mouth may be open. We'll say it is. And his mouth, we'll say it's possibly open but he's definitely out of the picture because his mouth is closed. So we have two good candidates and two possible candidates based on the mouth specification. Now, let's suppose I said, the man that I'm thinking about is wearing a blue sweater. Well, the search now has gone from six to five to four to two because there are two here with a blue sweater but um, you don't know which one it is. They both have open mouths. They both are guys. 
So I give you another specification and I say, this fellow that I have in mind has two hands. Well, we see the two hands of this person, but we would assume if this guy has got his hands uh, on the end of his arms, we would assume that he would have two hands as well, although we can't see them. So we can't really rule out this person, but we can say this guy for sure has two hands, and so we would likely narrow our search until the next specification would be given. And the last specification is, the guy that I'm thinking of has dark brown hair. Well, here he is. The guy with the blue sweater, the open mouth, the dark brown hair, having two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. And you can see that by a process of aligning all the specifications, we, you have been able to select and identify the same person out of this crowd of six that I wanted you to identify. Now, the reason I've gone through this kind of funny little uh, illustration is because I want you to understand that's the way the Bible works. When the Bible starts identifying the Antichrist, it gives us lots of clues about him. Granted, some of the clues can be misleading or inconclusive. Some of the clues can be uh, only portions of, well, it could be this way or that way. We can't say for sure. But when all of the clues are put together, only one creature, only one person can meet the specifications of the clue. God has put in his word many identities about the same thing so that as we get to the end, and actually it's at the end of time, that Bible prophecy becomes essentially, yes, essential unto salvation, important. A lot of people say to me, you know, Larry, prophecy is not important to my salvation at all. Yes, I could agree with you at this moment. That is a fair statement. But I will disagree with you if you imply that that will always be the case. God has not foretold about the mark of the beast and the Antichrist and the development of these events so that we could just speculate endlessly on what they may or may not be. God has put them in his word so that at the appointed time, those who have ears to hear and eyes to see will understand what is truth and not be deceived and beguiled and swept away to destruction. You need to understand Bible prophecy, and you need to be working on it right now. God's Word can be understood. The mysteries of Daniel, what was sealed up until the time of the end, have been unfolded. The rules of interpretation that govern our understanding of Bible prophecy have been unsealed. And now the whole picture is quite clear, and we can understand what is about to take place. And the profound thing, and it bothers me, the coming of the Antichrist is a topic that very few preachers are willing to talk about. The coming of the Antichrist and what his purpose is and what his mission and what his duration is all about is an issue that most preachers know nothing about, although they claim to know God's word. It distresses me that this is an oncoming and calamitous global catastrophe that's about to happen, and very few people even consider it. Let's go back to the computer screen, and let me pick up some. I'm going to change this picture out here for a moment, and I'm going to bring another one over for you to look at. I'm going to zoom in here for a minute because I want you to look in the book of Daniel and notice, let's look at this part of the screen for a moment. The book of Daniel, let's see, I guess you can see that. The book of Daniel 
um, ca carries a number of prophetic timelines. You remember, well, I might as well start from the beginning here so that uh, you're not con totally confused. In Daniel 2, we have a vision that includes the head, the chest, the thighs, the legs, the feet, and the toes, and then the rock. You, you know the story of Daniel 2, I hope. And then in Daniel 7, we have the lion, the bear, the leopard, the monster. And these are parallels of, of what has been previously stated in Daniel 2. Parallels with enlargement, because in Daniel 7, we pick up with the ten horns that come up out of the monster Rome, the ten kingdoms that bring Rome to an end, that is, the civil Rome. And then we have the appearance of the little horn, or the eighth horn, which persecutes the saints for 1260 years, and this represents the Church of Rome, or the Christian Church, Roman Catholic Church. And then we find the church is uh, afflicted and, and, uh, by a deadly force in, by, in Napoleon's day in 1798. The power of the church is brought uh, over Europe, is brought to an end. And then in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, we start and find the commencement of the judgment of the uh, people of earth. The judgment has been going on since 1844. And the, and the judgment comes in two phases. There's the judgment of the dead. Let me, exam let me blow this up just a little bit here. Here's the judgment of the dead and the judgment of the living. The judgment of the living takes place during the Great Tribulation, and that little red box behind here represents the time period of the Great Tribulation. The judgment of the dead began in 1844, and that phase is trans transitions to the judgment of the living when the trumpets of Revelation began to be sounded, or the Great Tribulation uh, occurs. So we have a process of judgment, which is spoken of in Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. During the time period of the judgment of the living, the king of the north and the horn power of Daniel 8 will appear. This is the Antichrist, and he will set up the ten kings as his rulers over the earth. Well, we're out of time at the moment. We'll have to continue in our next segment, but I'd like to send you a free copy of my little book, Warning, Revelation is About to be Fulfilled. Call us at 1-800-475-0876, and I'll be happy to send you a free copy of my little book, Warning, Revelation is About to be Fulfilled. Absolutely free, no strings attached, if you'll just give us a call. Well, that's all the time we have for now. We're going to pick up in our next segment on when does the Antichrist appear. May God bless you, is my prayer.